Last week, we needed this reminder. The Bible was not written in chapters and verses, especially Paul's letters. They're letters. They weren't meant to have stopping places and starting places. You don't just pull out a, a part of the letter and read it without understanding what he said before. Because if you don't know what he said before, if you don't have that as a point of reference, you might not understand what he's saying right now. Now, we all have favorite parts of the Bible. We all have favorite parts of letters that we get. I, even to this day, can pull out an old letter that uh, I got from my wife, my girlfriend at the time, my fiance, my wife, or other people in my past, and I could still pull out some of those old letters and, and go back and reread my favorite parts. And they might make me laugh, they might make me cry, they might just make me feel good. And we do that with the Word of God. But we're going to be looking today at something else that Paul tells us about the new life in his letter to the church at Ephesus, the book of Ephesians. So open your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Now we're going to begin reading in verses 15 through 20. But again, if we're going to understand what he's saying in verse 15, we need to pull out a couple other verses that come before that in chapter 5. I'm going to read verse 8 and verse 10, and then verse 15 will make better sense to us, and we'll know what he's talking about. In verse, uh, verse 8, about the midway through verse 8, he says this, Now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. And then in verse 10, last part of verse 10, he says, And find out what pleases the Lord. Verse 15, where we start now. Be very careful, then, how you live. We are light in the Lord. Find out what pleases the Lord. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, <clears throat> making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk with wine or on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. May God add His blessings to the reading of His Word. Now last week we talked about the new life. We've been in this now for four or five weeks. I'm losing track. But we talked about a life that is conformed to our Heavenly Father, where He says, Be imitators of God as dearly loved children. Be an imitator of God. Be like Daddy, like Father, like Son, like Father, like Daughter, like Father, like You, like Father, like Me. Now, we said last week we didn't all have loving fathers. Some of us may, our father may not have even been in the picture. He may have been abusive. He may have been neglectful. He might have, been neglectful. He might have abandoned us. But he said, he gives us a, a conditional statement here where he says, imitate God. Just be like your heavenly father as a dearly loved child. And then he says two things from there. He says, and live a life of love and live a life of light. Now, we looked at those last week. And if we go in all the way back to chapter 4, verse 1, we would know this. The new life is a changed life. It is a contrasted life. 
It is a corrected life. Last week, it is a conformed life, a life that conforms itself to the image of God and to God our Father. And today, we focus on verse 15 through 20, which is a careful life. Look at verse 15 again. He says, be very careful. Now, what's interesting about the word, the original word in the Greek, and I think I have it up here on the screen, or I will. There it is. The original word is parateteo akribas, which simply means walk carefully. Watch your step. The word actually, with all of its meanings, carries the idea of being exact, straight, precise, much like this tightrope walker in our picture. The King James uses the word circumspect. It's a good word, nothing wrong with that word. But what it means is that, again, we walk carefully, not recklessly. Circumspect carries it with the idea that we know where we are and we know where we are going. The problem with a lot of people today is they don't even know where they are. They can't possibly know where they're going because they do not even know where they are. Circumspect. I heard a professor years ago define the word this way. We are to walk like a tomcat on a barbed wire fence between two bulldogs. <laughs> so every step has its own danger, the barbed wire. Any miss, any misstep has its own consequence, one of two hungry bulldogs. And that to me is one of the most picturesque visions I've ever seen of what it means to live a careful life. Each and every step is deliberate. We can think of it this way. We can think of it as God's GPS. Now GPS, of course, we know that stands for uh, Global Positioning System, which every one of you who has a smartphone, and I think almost all of you do, your phone will tell you exactly where you are to the degree, to the minute, and to the second. By the way, did you know you could do that? You just pull up your map online, just pull up your Google map, and wherever that blue dot is, if, if you have your locator turned on, there will be a blue dot in the middle of the map. That's right where you're sitting right now. You hold your finger on that dot, and at the top of your phone will appear the exact coordinates of your location. I will never forget during Gulf Storm one night, some of you were not alive then, but Gulf Storm one, the first time we went to war uh, with Iraq over Kuwait. I will never forget those years ago when I was fascinated by the fact that our, we had bombs, smart bombs, that could be controlled by GPS. And they could get, they could get it down to the place where they could choose which window in a building, which window in a house, they wanted the bomb to go through. That's how precise it is. That's the word circumspect. To be careful how we live. I call it God's, pos uh, God's positioning system. In case you're wondering, by the way, you're sitting right now at 38 degrees. 36 minutes, 16.48 second north, and 97 degrees, 64 minutes, which is kind of a puzzle to me because I thought it ended at 60 minutes and it went to another degree. But anyway, this is what my phone told me. 97 degrees, 64 minutes, uh, and then 62.68 seconds west. That's where you're at right now. Well, within a few points of a second. Just depending on which seat you're sitting in. Can you imagine what it would be like to be able to live our life so precisely? Most of us, I don't know about you, but I have some days when I feel like 
my life is just off. You ever feel like that? That you're not where you ought to be? That you're not doing what you ought to be doing? And I'll tell you what, folks, the best advice I can give in a situation like that is just let the Lord know that. Just tell him, God, I, I don't feel right. Am I where you want me right now? Am I doing what you want me to do right now? The question is, how does one live one's life carefully? What map are we using? What GPS is guiding us? Well, let me share with you several scriptures. Number one, Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Your word, God's word, a lamp to my feet. Now, what's interesting about that? If, if you really put yourself back in the time when that psalm was written, anybody know what they used for lamps? Little clay lamp. Little clay lamp, about how big? Yeah, about that big. It's about, oh, I don't know, what would you call that size? Palm of your hand. Yeah, it's much smaller than a softball. About, like about, about as big around as a baseball, maybe. A little oval shape. Filled with olive oil, and you had a little wick in it, and that was your light. Not a lot of light. And the picture gives us as a lamp to our feet. So if you can imagine, if you had a little lamp on this foot, and a little lamp on that foot, and how far do you think you could see? Not very far, just a few steps at a time. Many of us are trying to see what's way out there. And God says, you know what? It doesn't matter what's way out there if you don't know what's right in front of you. A careful life is careful not only about what's way out there, but a careful life is careful about what's right in front of it. And God's word will... Some, listen, it's God's word that gets you from one day to the next. And sometimes from one minute to the next. Thy word is a lamp to my feet. It's a light unto my path. It's long before LED. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Now, the modern translation says, He will make your path straight. But He will, he will direct you. He will give you directions. As a matter of fact, it's one of the things that I pray for every day. I've got five things I pray for every day. They're written at the front of my Bible. I've shared these with you in the past. They're on my computer. I've got a little sticker at the, at the, at the bottom of my computer, mo computer monitor. And yes, I still have an old computer with an old monitor. I also have a laptop, all right? I have a smartphone. I have all those fun little devices. I don't have a, I don't have a tablet, but that's because I'm not, a, uh, I'm not an Apple guy. I'm a, I'm an old, uh, I'm, the other, I'm the other kind, okay? But anyways, one of the things I put on there every day is, God, direct my paths. Direct my steps. Because if you are in the right place, you're less likely to do the wrong thing. So we need a life that is careful. Exodus 23, 13 says this, Be careful to do. Everything I have said to you. Do not invoke the names of other gods. Do not let them be heard on your lips. This carefulness goes all the way down to the very things that we say. Joshua 1 8. He gives Joshua this injunction. He says, Do not let this book of the law. By the way, at the time, all they had was the first five books the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay? That's all there was. The five books of Moses. And he says to him, he says, Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, but meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful. Everybody say careful. careful. That's the word. Careful. Careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Did you know that the Bible is the first success book ever written? I don't care what author you follow, I don't care how many books you read about how to be successful. You will never be more successful if you do not read the Word of God. So it's a careful life. But how do we live that? 
Now here in verses 15 through 20, Paul gives us some step-by-step -step instructions on how to live a careful life. Verse 15, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Never have we lived in a time where there is so much knowledge, so much information, and so much stupidity. Some people might call it common sense. Another word for it would be wisdom. The word wise here comes from a Greek word sophos, which comes from another word sophia, which means wisdom. If you add another word to that, philo, or phileo in the Greek, which means love, put it together, you've got philosophy, which means the love of wisdom. We live in a world where philosophy has been whatever people make it, whatever they want it to be, and we no longer really have a true philosophy or a love of wisdom. So the question is this, where do I go to find wisdom? Let me tell you where you will not find it. You will not find wisdom on Google. You will not find wisdom on a college campus. You may not even find wisdom in your home. Maybe not find it in your parents. As a matter of fact, you can go to a lot of places in this world and not find wisdom because wisdom is not found in a place. It's found in a person and in your relationship with that person. Where do I find wisdom? The answer is found in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You know, we call that a, a view, a world view. A world view is whether or not your, your view of life, your view of everything in existence is based on the teachings of this world or if it's based on the teachings of the Word of God. Do you have a biblical world view? Do you have a world view that begins with a relationship with Almighty God? If you do not know God, you don't have you don't have any access to true wisdom. The Bible says in Psalm 111 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There it is again. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. That's God's GPS. Proverbs 1 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. I could give you so many practical uh, examples of that. So, a careful life is wise. A careful life, we've already said it, it's the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So the careful life worships God. I had this discussion with a friend of mine the other day. I said, man, let me know. I want to know something. He said, when, when did you believe in God? When did you start to think or question, is there a God and, and should I believe in Him? And, and I found out he was not very unusual. He said, well, he said, I came to know now." Believe in God, he said, when I was six. Wow. Well, my, my experience is similar to that. Actually, last week, uh, yeah, it was a week ago, I met a guy from Strasburg, Virginia, as a matter of fact. And uh, he had been in prison for 10 years. After he got out of prison, 
He, he, had, he had met this girl. Uh, she led him to Christ. He got saved. His life was completely changed. He became a builder, became a carpenter, became a builder, became very affluent as a, as a builder. He also uh, got on fire for Jesus Christ and he began living a life for Christ. But this man did not come to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior till he was in his 30s. I believed in God since I can remember. Definitely the age of three, going on to the age of four. Now, I did not come to know Jesus Christ as my Savior until I was 12, because you see, I did not understand that even though He had died for my sins, I still needed to ask Him to be my Savior. There was the difference. I wasted nine years of my life by not understanding that His death was, yes, it was for my sins, but I needed to personally receive Him. See, the Bible says, to as many receive Him, to them give you power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on His name. Well, I already believed. But I never invited him to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Have you? Do you worship God? And I don't mean a God, I mean the God. One man said several years ago, he said, well, he's, somebody asked him, said, do you believe in God? He said, no. He said, don't you believe in God? He said, no. He said, I know God. There's the difference. Do you know for certain that you have eternal life? You go to heaven when you die. Worship's God. But you know what? The Bible tells us that people that don't know Him, it says this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. You know, if, if you study genetics, you study astrophysics, you study physics, you study geology, whatever scientific discipline you may be a pursuer of. The proof of God is everywhere. Everywhere. One of the laws of physics, ladies and gentlemen, is that you don't get something from nothing. Nothing does not create something. So where does the something come from? Most scientists would say, well, it came from someone. It came from something. Our world, is, our world, our universe is incredibly designed. It says eternal power and nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. And Now I used to read that as a kid and thought he was talking about evolution. But no, he's talking about the false gods, the gods of thousands of years ago that were made to look like these various things. But evolution kind of fits there, doesn't it? But Romans 3.18 sums it up this way. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There is no worship of God. So if you want to live a careful life, live a wise life, live a worshipful life, a life that worships God, and then number three, avoid wickedness. Avoid wickedness. Notice what it says back in verse 15. Where it says, not as unwise, but as wise. So what is unwise? The word unwise here basically amounts to the word wicked or wickedness or wickedly. Now, my dad was a blue-collar guy. He worked as an electrician. 
worked for the Atomic Energy Commission in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. He was a master electrician. He worked with nuclear power. He worked with high voltage electricity. He never graduated high school. He learned his trade in the Navy during the Second World War. When he came out, he, pers he pursued uh, his knowledge by going back to trade school and getting his, uh, his, well, his knowledge about electricity. Later, he got tired of doing that, became a businessman. My dad is one of those guys you would call a self-made man. But he had his, his, his philosophy was always very common sense. And he had all these little sayings that he grew me, you know, he raised me with. And I, I remember just about all of them. One of the ones, one of the ones I really love the best is, son, if you didn't need it when you went in the store, you didn't need it when you came out of the store. That saved me so much money, folks. <laughs> but one he told me that after reflecting on the Word of God, one he told me I realized wasn't good. He'd say, son, if you can't be good, be careful. Now, it sounds good, doesn't it? If you can't be good, be careful. That is bad advice, ladies and gentlemen. Because if we live a careful life, we avoid wickedness. In other words, you cannot live a careful life if it is not a good life. Are you following me? Romans 16, 19. Let me read these verses to you. Everyone has heard about your obedience. So I am full of joy over you. But I want you to be wise. That's what he says. I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Now, the Bible doesn't want us to be naive, okay? We, we need to know the difference between what is good and what is evil. It doesn't mean to be naive. It doesn't mean to be stupid. It's okay to even be street smart, okay? But to be innocent of it, to not to participate of it, to not partake of it. Another place, 1 Corinthians 14, 20. Brothers, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants. Again, not naive, but in your thinking, be adults. Think like an adult. Matter of fact, James 3.13 says it this way. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good deeds. By deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Now, a movie character by the name of Forrest Gump used to put it this way. Stupid is, stupid does. So wise is, wise does. It really is that simple. Avoid wickedness. And then James chapter 4 verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil. Avoid evil. And he will flee from you. So, a careful life is wise. A careful life worships God. A careful life avoids wickedness. And then number four, a careful life, number four, does not waste time. I got a message on my phone this morning, which is sitting right there. According to my phone, I was on my phone three hours and eight minutes longer than I was the week before. You know what that means? I had too much time on my hands. I wasted so much time. We waste so much of our time on these so-called smart devices. If you have the time, the Bible says to redeem it. Back in verse 16, go back to our text. Look at verse 16, Ephesians 5. Making the most of every opportunity. Or as it says in the King James, redeeming 
the time. Buy back the time. Make use of the time. Because the days are evil. What do you do with your time? How good of a steward are you of the time that God gives you? Now, listen, don't misunderstand. <laughs> I'm not asking that we go 24-7, seven days a week. I'm not saying that. Everybody needs a certain amount of sleep. Everybody needs a certain amount of rest. God gave us this thing called the Sabbath that we might rest from our labors. It's okay to rest. It's okay, as my friend likes to tell me, hey, be good to you. That's all right. Be good to yourself. It's all right to, 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 like the guy says on the internet all the time, he says we men have something called a nothing box. You know, what are you thinking about, nothing? And that just mystifies you ladies, that we guys can think about nothing, but you know we're also good sometimes at doing nothing. And we've got to be very careful. We've got to be good stewards of our time. Let me give you some scripture for this one. Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatever your hand finds it to do, do it with all your might. For in the grave where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. Romans 13, 11-14, and do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Do you waste time? You ever do that and you just regret it? You, you don't feel right? It's kind of like that whole thing of being circumspect, the whole thing. You, you don't know where you're going because you, you don't know where you are. We waste time. It goes on to say this, the night is nearly over, the day is almost here. <clears throat> so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality, and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of your sinful nature. In other words, use your time for good pursuits, not evil pursuits. We talk about avoiding wickedness. The worst thing in the world for us is to have time for which we don't account. The old saying is, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. We get in trouble. I get in trouble when I'm alone and I'm doing nothing. Galatians 6.10 Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. And uh, there are other scriptures I could use. Uh, Galatians, uh, Colossians 4.6, others. Before I go on with this, though, I've I just feel like I have to say this. If you don't feel like you have opportunities, ladies and gentlemen, make them. Make opportunities. I think if there's anything that's, that's really holding the church back is that we don't make opportunities. If, if God gives us opportunities, we don't recognize them. Or we're just not doing anything and we don't realize that a phone call could be made, a visit could be made, a prayer could be prayed, a testimony could be shared. We are surrounded by opportunities to live for Christ, but we don't. A careful life does not waste time. Notice what it says, it says back in verse 16. Let's look at that whole verse again. There, it says, making the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil. The Greek word for evil there is poneros. It's exactly the same word that's used in the Lord's Prayer. Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the evil one. Every day has the potential of evil, hurt, calamity, and peril. Now you may think this is silly. I don't know. Every time I get in my vehicle to go somewhere, I say, Father, protect me. Protect my vehicle. You want to have good auto insurance rates? 
Forget about Geico. Go to God. Okay? Lord, protect me. Protect my vehicle. Make me vigilant, God. Let me be circumspect. Let me do the maintenance on my vehicle that I need to do. Take nothing for granted. Why? Because the days are evil. You know, Murphy's Law, if anything can go wrong, it will. Right? Use your time, folks. Use it wisely. Because the opportunity for peril is everywhere around us. A careful life is about how we respond to the hardness and the hurts of life. My life verse has, is and has been for years. This verse, 2 Corinthians 5.15. And he died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. I need that every day. Now, most of you in this room know that, uh, I don't know how many weeks ago it's been now. Uh, probably eight weeks, I guess. I was in the hospital. And when I was in the emergency room and they got me stabilized and got ready to move me to an upstairs room, I asked the doctor when they pulled those two big patches off my chest, and all the hair that came with it. Whew. Ooh, that was the worst part of the whole thing. I looked at the doctor and I said, what are those? And he said, oh, those were the power patches. And I said, what? He says, well, that's where we put the paddles. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, we thought you were going to code. <laughs> I want you to know that uh, this time has been different for me. I know if I ever have another attack like this one, I won't survive it. I know that. I get short of breath sometimes at night and uh, it worries me. I also want you to know that I have a note on the door of the room in which I sleep. And on that note, it says, if I have passed and you find me, call these phone numbers. My wife isn't home right now, as you know. Her number and my oldest daughter's phone number are on that note on the door behind which I sleep. But I'm still here eight weeks later and I keep wondering why am I here Lord what is your purpose for me what am I to be doing with the time that you have given me I'm going to tell you what folks the worst part of every day for me is when that get to that point in the day and we all get there when I get to the point in the day where I don't know what I want to do or what I what I need to do next if there's nothing on my agenda there's nothing on my schedule Except looking at stupid TikToks or surfing what's on TV or whatever. Or deciding what I'm going to have for supper or whatever. If there's nothing there, that's the worst time of day for me. Because I don't want to waste my life. I don't want to waste the time. I was reminded of a poem when I was recovering in the hospital by C.T. Studd. C.T. Studd was a, a British missionary and he wrote this poem called Only One Life. I gave you a copy in your bulletin today. Would you pull it out? If nothing else, you can take this with you. Keep it somewhere. Two little lines I heard one day traveling along life's busy way bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Here's the two lines. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. 
Then, in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before His judgment seat, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life. The still, small voice gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life. A few brief years. Each with its burdens, hopes, and fears. Each with its days I must fulfill. Living for self or in His will. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep. In joy or sorrow, thy word to keep. Faithful and true, whate'er the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn, and from the world now let me turn, living for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life. Yes, only one. Now let me say, Thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I'll know, I know I'll say, T'was worth it all. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When I am dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee. God's people said, Amen. Amen. A careful life doesn't waste time. Number five, a careful life seeks and knows God's will. Verse 17. There, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So many verses. Just a couple here. Paul writes and he says to the Colossians, he says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for human desires, but rather for the will of God. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And then finally and lastly, a careful life wants, crave, and is filled with the wine of God's Spirit. Where it says, and I love the King James, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Two things. Careful life is careful with what it consumes. If you want to know the most important thing in your life, then all you really need to do is go look at your own checkbook. Now, this is a different time. Most people don't even have a checkbook anymore. You go on your smartphone, you bring up your bank. Just sometimes go through that. 
Remember how you keep track with spreadsheet, QuickBooks, uh, smartphone, your bank, whatever. Go through all that stuff. See what you, listen, look where your money goes. Where does your money go? That's what you consume. Now, mortgage, car payments, we all have those. If you don't have a car payment, God bless you. If you don't have a mortgage payment, God bless you. But what are you doing? What do you consume? We need to be careful with what we eat, with what we drink, what we read, what we see, what we hear, what we believe. Do we consume the things of this world? Are we filling our minds and our spirits with garbage? You know, things like TikTok, Acts, Instagram, or Facebook. I like to ask people, are we on Facebook or is our face in the book? Or are we filling ourselves with His Word and with His Holy Spirit? Be not drunk with wine. Be not filled or under the influence of wine. But be filled with the Spirit. Not here today, but we've got some folks that uh, still struggle with some addictions in their lives. We've got people that come to Calvary here that struggle with alcoholism and and other things. And I was really hoping they'd be here to hear this part today. But under whose influence do you live? So a careful life is careful with what it consumes. Number two, a careful life is careful with what controls it. What controls your life? Be not filled with wine wherein is excess. But be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be filled. Under the influence. Do we give our car keys to just anyone? Do we give, our, do we give control of our life to those who want what is good? Don't be under the influence. Or if you are, who or what influences our life, our decisions, our opinions, our words, our direction? A careful life is under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We know this verse, many of us should know this verse by heart. But the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, what control does the Spirit have in our life? What are the, what's the fruit, what's the work that the Spirit does in our life? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That is a careful life. It's also, and we're going to see this next week, a controlled life. Our consumption results in true worship. What do we consume? And who consumes us? With what do we fill our hearts and our lives? Let's finish that section of Scripture. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be very careful then how you live. A life that cares about God and others. A life about His control. This is the new life that Jesus gives us every day. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And God's people said, Amen. Let's stand together.